It's a Christmas movie about a suicidal man, about bank runs, about violence. It's a wonderful life. This movie is so fascinating because people have watched it, and at least in the United States, every Christmas for the last 30 to 50 years. What's this movie about? Let me go through its many aspects and analyze it for you and show you its vast complexity. Coming up next. It's a Wonderful Life, 1947 movie by Frank Capra, famous Hollywood director by this point, who had done World War II movies, and Hollywood star Jimmy Stewart, America's sweetheart in a way, the actor everybody loves. And this movie is so homey and pleasant. I think that's one of the reasons why people still watch it. But if you really look at it, the movie is about a suicidal man who considers it's better maybe that I had never been born and George Bailey is really considering killing himself in the movie so you have to have heaven intervene the angel Clarence and the other angels in order to stop a suicidal man from killing himself he's got several kids he's got a wonderful wife a lot of relationships in the town spent a long time in the town and he's going to kill himself fascinating movie premise here because 1947 what's happening this is right after World War II but George. George? For F on account of his ear, George fought the Battle of Bedford Falls. Hold on, hold on, hold on now. Don't you know there's a war on? And we need to think of It's a Wonderful Life, I think, first as a post-World War II movie and Capra's social, social political statement about what we should do right after World War II. And it is a dark deep, serious statement, It's a Wonderful Life, despite the overwhelming joy and exuberation of George Bailey and the sentimentalism of this movie, the joy he experiences at the end, it's a dark movie about World War II and the aftermath. For a lot of these post-World War II movies, they're deep, dark, and disturbing. If you look at Hollywood movies from after, say, 1945 through the early 50s, a lot of the major mainstream releases, for example, The Best Years of Our Lives, about three veterans coming back home and being unable to adjust to civilian life, or movies like Orson Welles' The Stranger, in which Nazis are still running around, or have escaped Germany and are running around America. There are a lot of dark, noirish movies at this time, and It's a Wonderful Life at the end, in about the last 30 minutes, when George Bailey is considering suicide, and then Clarence takes him around the town to see what his life would have been like had he not been born, it's pretty darn dark and noir. It's this very strange, weird mix of tones. You got caprid sentimentalism, happy exuberance about the small town, and yet the deep, dark violence of the town hinted at throughout the movie, whether it's Gower hitting George Bailey, whether it's George Bailey getting upset at various people like his family when he comes home after he loses the $8,000. Where's that money, you silly, stupid old fool? Where's that money? You realize what this means? It means bankruptcy and scandal and prison. This movie is very much about social relations above self-interest. Potter is the self-interested businessman who's out for himself and out to monopolistically dominate the small town. In the fantasy world where George Bailey doesn't exist, it becomes Pottersville. And what, what does Pottersville look like? It's an immoral hellhole, kind of like Las Vegas. There are strip clubs, you know, there are casinos there. But George Bailey is not self-interested at all. In fact, he denies his self-interest repeatedly throughout this movie. He would like to go build bridges and go see the world and go make a lot of money, as his friend Sam Wainwright does. But he doesn't. He stays at home. And at various times, you see him in crisis moments, forced, he thinks, to stay home and do his duty, whether that's when his father has a stroke, when he's going out with Mary, as you remember, and singing, Buffalo Gals, won't you come out tonight? His father has a stroke. That keeps him home because... The Building and Loan Board of Trustees want him to stay on as the president of the Building and Loan. Let's see, no, no, that, the point is, in order to get this robe, I've got it. I'll make a deal with you, Mary. George, come on home, quick. Your father's had a stroke. As well, and maybe most importantly, staying back in Bedford Falls to marry Mary instead of going out and visiting the world. 
these are American bourgeois values, getting married, having kids, uh, loving your town and being a dutiful citizen there. And that's over and against George Bailey's individual self-interested desires. The movie put, pits those two together and then you have this external depiction of them with Bailey versus Potter throughout the entire movie. Potter being the domineering businessman, something George Bailey could have become had he not been a virtuous bourgeois American. But George Bailey decides, I will you know, subvert my self-interest and do my duties as it were. You did it, George. You did it. They got one condition. Huh? Only one condition. What's that? And that's the best part of it. They've appointed George here as executive secretary to take his father's place. Oh, no, but Uncle Billy is... You can is, keep him on. That's all right. As secretary, you can hire anyone you like. Well, Dr. Cameron, now let's get this thing straight. I'm leaving. I'm leaving right now. I'm going to school. This is my last chance. Uncle Billy here, he's your man. But George, they'll vote with Potter otherwise. I might even call this a Kantian movie in terms of Kantian ethics. You know, you should will the universal good. It's a very reductive way of, of putting Kantian ethics, but it does have a lot of a suppression of interest and pleasure to do your duty. And I feel like that's what George Bailey is doing throughout this movie. He is pushing down and suppressing his desires in order to do duties, whether that be for America, the small town, his family, his business, the people in uh, who, you know, who subscribe to his business in the building alone. Now you listen to me. I don't want any plastics, and I don't want any ground floors, and I don't want to get married ever to anyone. You understand that? I want to do what I want to do. And you're... And you're... Oh, George, George, George. There are many scenes of the vivaciousness of small town life then, and George Bailey, because he subverts his desires or suppresses his desires and does his duties, he's rewarded by goodwill with his neighbors. He's done good to his neighbors. He gets goodwill returned to him, of course, at the end of the movie, but really throughout. And there are several scenes where you see Bailey amongst a crowd of people. Although Jimmy Stewart stands out because he's so tall, you see him with the crowd of people he's helping out, whether that's the Martinis, the Italian family he's helping move into a home, whether that's during the bank run and he's trying to inspire people to stick with the building and loan, whether that's the dance scene near the beginning of the movie, right before he's gonna go off and see the world supposedly, but he falls in love with Mary instead, and at the end. So all of these scenes where people keep crowding into the camera and one by one, two by two, they keep coming onto camera and you get this idea of social relationships, social networks. This is the thing that obviously Capra and the filmmakers here are privileging over and above the economic self-interest of Potter, the monopolistic dominance of Potter. And I think this is supposed to be the World War II values, the self-sacrifice that people had during World War II. They're supposed to maintain it and not give in to greedy businessmen who might dominate the American landscape or the world landscape, a la Potter. And this is a morality play then, this movie, of this global problem or American problem centered in Bedford Falls. Coupled with the social relations and the economic relations, and you get the, the different bank levels between Potter, the dominant banker who wants to control everybody's you know, deposits and their interest and you know run their houses and give them shady loans or difficult loans to pay back versus the homegrown, small town, George Bailey owned, family owned building and loan, the Bailey building and loan, what does that do? It too sacrifices, like Bailey does, profits and interest in favor of giving people homes that are fairly cheap. And George Bailey is praised for doing that throughout the movie. So you have two different styles of banking, something that Capra is interested in talking about his whole career. Of course, he made movies during the Great Depression. And you see bank runs in this movie. You see 
Potter and the loan thing come up in this movie a lot. So two different styles of banking. Now what's interesting to me, if you know enough about fractional reserve banking, you know that Bailey and Potter share the same problem, which is that their banks are inherently bankrupt. They don't have enough money in reserve to cover all their deposits if their depositors come calling for their money, which is what a bank run is, which is what happens in this movie. So the thing that stops the bank run, interestingly, is George Bailey's charisma and speech trying to hold everyone together in social bonds through his speech and his words so that the building and loan, the Bailey building and loan, can stay in business. It is a bankrupt business though, inherently, and maybe it should fall apart. But because George Bailey is such a virtuous American small town guy, because speech, his speech is so great, and he inspires people to maintain their social bonds, and because he gives up his $2,000 in honeymoon or money for, for his marriage, and he's willing to sacrifice, once again, self-interested sacrifice, and giving up his honeymoon and his wedding money to you know, give to the building and loan people during the bank run. That's what stops the bank run, maintains social relationships, glues the town together, and keeps Bedford Falls together, as we learn at the end of the movie. Yeah. Oh. Now, Randall, wait, now, wait. Now, listen. Now, listen to me. I, I beg of you not to do this thing. If Potter gets a hold of this building and loan, there'll never be another decent house built in this town. He's already got charge of the bank, he's got the bus line, he's got the department stores, and now he's after us. Why? Well, it's very simple, because we're cutting in on his business, that's why. As well, this movie, to me, has very hokey theology. It's generic and watered down. You have nominal Christianity, cultural Christianity here, with small-town, good-feeling America. But really, there's only one shot of a church, there's some shots of people praying to a generic god, and there are these, I must say, hokey angels in the sky. It mixes angels and stars, and the idea of wishing upon your lucky stars at the beginning of the movie and then throughout you have this idiot angel literally he's called that intelligence of a rabbit clarence who helps out george bailey in order to get his wings it sounds like a trade or karma or something more than it does orthodox christian theology which i would say is being ditched here in favor of feel-good americanism and you get this sort of watered down christianity that happens at this time and, and continuing on through the 21st century the watering down of mainline Christianity, the loss of it in these major churches, whether Presbyterian or Episcopal or Methodist. And this movie is signaling, not intentionally or not wanting to, but signaling really the decline of Christianity in general in favor of bourgeois citizenship in America. Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That may sound harsh, but I still like this movie overall as far as its values go for, you know, having a family, having a, a nice small town where you have kids and neighbors who are playing in the streets and everyone loves each other to an extent and helps each other out. Uh, uh, who couldn't like that in a way? I mean, who doesn't want, uh, you know, social bonds that are that strong like the ones you see in the movie? Come in, Uncle Billy. Everybody in here. Mary did it, George. Mary did it. She told some people you were in trouble with it. They scattered all over town collecting money. Didn't ask any questions. Just said, George, in trouble. Tell me. You spread like spread In another angle, you have George Bailey's choice between Violet, the hot blonde, and Mary, the very nice, homey woman. And who is the virtuous American bourgeois hero going to choose? He could have chosen Violet, but, you know, it ends up he helps her out along the way. She's hot to trot, but Mary is too frisky as well. And I think George Bailey stays behind in Bedford Falls for biological reasons as well. There, there's some very <laughs> steamy scenes between Mary and George. But nevertheless, there's a choice between women here. And that's like the choice between towns or between bankers, Potter versus Bailey, Pottersville versus Bedford Falls, a Mary versus Violet. There, there's some weird choices there. Also, Sam Wainwright and his money versus staying at home. Now, despite, as I said, the feel-good sentimentalism of this movie, there's a lot of hints of violence and death, whether that's George Bailey's brother dying or nearly dying at the beginning of the movie, whether that's Gower slapping the young George Bailey in the head and blood pouring out of his ear, whether that's George Bailey getting drunk 
and crashing into a tree with his car and then wandering off and nearly committing suicide. Whether it's George Bailey yelling at his children, getting very upset and telling him to shut up. There's some hints of, of serious violence and abuse problems in this town and in small town America. And, you know, for that reason, the movie is, as a Christmas movie, pretty dark and disturbing if you want to think about it. Yes, you should love your life and appreciate what you've got. But there, if you just slip a little bit or slip into this depression that George Bailey does, thinking maybe it's better off that I would be dead, then you've got the all of these serious social and personal problems, psychological demons, as it were, that at this point in time, 1946-47, are coming up for Americans all across the country. You have soldiers coming home from the war with PTSD, screaming in their beds at night, not being able to adjust to civilian life, being very disturbed, being wounded, even just having casualties, uh, you know, losing a leg or a limb or something like that, which wouldn't let you adjust to the war. And your social relationships are a mess once people come back because, well, some people have been at work and some people can't find work and some people are poor and some people are psychologically disturbed. This movie, It's a Wonderful Life, is addressing all of those or attempting to personal, social, and cultural problems in America in the 1940s after the war. And because it is so, you know, attacking serious problems that probably are still around to some extent. I mean, we still have soldiers with PTSD. We still have people who are impoverished. We still have people, obviously, who have psychological problems, a lot of depression in this country and abuse. This movie plays really well sentimentally as, you know, pepping you up to love your life and be joyful in your life. So for that reason, I can't knock this movie for that, even though I think some of its economic and theological messages are a mess. I think this movie still has a lot of value, and for that reason, I'd still watch it. What do you think of this analysis? What do you think of this movie? I'd love to hear your concerns and questions and comments. Put them down below, and please subscribe to this channel for more great content. Thank you, and have a great day.